technicians inside will help lay us back into our chairs. They will strap us to the chairs, and that as they leave, they will close the side hatch, the access arm will be retracted, and we will be left alone. And we will be in the grips of two fundamental emotions while we're out there, one of which is gut fear. You will fear for your life while you're out there. But at the same time that you're frankly terrified, you're also going to be boundlessly joyful. Because for most astronauts, it truly is a lifetime quest to make this flight. And with that at hand, we're going to be overwhelmed with joy. Now, T minus six seconds, the three liquid engines start. When that occurs, eight and a half minutes up, the autopilot shuts off the engines. The gas tank is empty. It's jettisoned. All that remains now headed to orbit is the winged vehicle. And we call that the orbiter. And now we're on our way to the International Space Station. I have a safety point here that I want to make that I think will help make you safer in these environments. Uh, the topic is normalization of deviance, or rather I should say defending ourselves against normalization of deviance. Uh, this is a term I picked up in an excellent book uh, by Diane Vaughn titled The Challenger Launch Decision. Now, I'll define that term here in just a moment. But relevant to this discussion will be the story of the Challenger disaster. So I'm going to tell that story. But as I tell it, I want everybody to be viewing it in the context of the moment. In the context of the moment for NASA and the contractor team, it was a time of immense changes in the NASA mission. I want you to look at the differences going from the Apollo program into the shuttle program. Apollo had a single very focused objective. So as we come into this tragedy, again, I want you to keep the context of the moment in mind and reviewing now. We've got tectonic changes in NASA's mission, ignorance of the difficulty of operating a reusable spacecraft, and promises of an unattainable schedule, launch schedule on an aggressively tight budget. I'm sure I probably just described a lot of the situations that you for, folks work in with uh, schedule and uh, budget pressures. Now, I'm going to tell the story of Challenger. Uh, Challenger was a result of the failure of the right-hand solid rocket booster. Look at the size of these things. You cannot catastrophe. Now, I'm not going to go into the engineering specifics of the joint design that was intended to prevent such gas, gas leakage, other than to say it was based on a redundant, flexible O-ring scheme. Two flexible O-rings sat in grooves 12 feet in diameter O-ring, sat in grooves at the perimeter of each of these segment joints to form a redundant steel-to-steel -steel pressure seal. On Challenger, both O-rings failed on the bottom segment of the right side rocket booster at ignition. This is Challenger coming off the pad, look in that yellow circled area, see that black smoke? That's the vaporized O-rings being shoved out that bottom joint. You now have 5,000 degrees. In this discussion, we're going to learn the answer to this age-old question, why do bad things happen to teams and individuals with stellar histories? And it doesn't get more stellar than NASA's history. Putting people on the moon and returning them safely was the greatest engineering accomplishment in the history of humanity. Nothing else comes close. And yet the same team, many of the very same people who orchestrated this incredible success 13 years later wrote the script for this tragedy right here. So that does beg the question. Why do bad things happen to teams with stellar histories? And too often when you do the autopsy on some tragedy, some terrible thing that's befallen the team, you will find that the team fell victim to a long-term normalization of deviance. What is this? Well, it's that natural human tendency in pressure circumstances, and it's almost always for you folks Anybody in corporate America, it's going to be budget-driven schedule pressures. But it could be individual uh, family issues that are distracting you and putting you under pressure. But it's a very human thing. You're in a pressure circumstance. Perhaps you're a leader leading your team in, under these pressures. Uh, you have a job to do. You've been trained at the best, best practice level. And now you say, hey, uh, we can't do this job at the best practice level because of this pressure we're under. We're going to have to tell you, I'm going to have to take these guys into a shortcut. So individually, or maybe a leader will take the team into a shortcut from uh, best practices. And what is the most common outcome of doing this? The com most common immediate outcome of shortcutting a best practice is what? You get away with it. Nothing immediately bad happens. So what does that do? It starts this false feedback that the absence of something bad happening implies the rightness of the decision to take the shortcut in the first place. 
So what's going to happen the next time you find yourself in these same pressure circumstances? And they're always the next time. Because nothing bad happened the first time you took that shortcut, you're going to be mightily tempted to do it again. And you get away with it enough times and slowly over time you come to expect that outcome. Why shouldn't you? You have this long history of having gotten away with it in the past. It's going to happen in the future. And so at some point that deviance becomes the norm. And now it's automatic to take the shortcut, automatic for you to lead your teams into the shortcut. You've gotten away with it so long, you're not even thinking of it as a shortcut anymore. And what happens with normalization of deviance is it leads to predictable surprises, another term I picked up in Diane Vaughn's book. And the predictable surprise is never very pleasant for the team. And I'll tell you, in hazardous environments, the predictable surprise can be injurious and it can be deadly. And if you ever want a lesson at a predictable surprise of what normalization of deviance is capable of doing, look at Challenger. Challenger was no accident. The time, it was a predictable surprise. At the time that rocket came apart, killing those seven astronauts on flight two, the backup O-ring held pressure. So all of these factors come into play to push the team into the shortcut, make some assembly process changes, we'll fix the problem on the fly. Now, flight operations resume, and even though we're now 23 missions away from Challenger, we're four years away from Challenger, this is the seminal moment of the Challenger disaster. Why? And you'll see this in a lot of tragedies. You go back and you'll find there was a moment when the team made that decision, we're going to shortcut our previously established best practices. And why? Because at that moment, when we do that, when teams do that, you establish a tolerance for something you previously said was intolerable to, to accept. Very hard now to go back to it. And what is the most common outcome? Go back to that best practice. And what's the most common immediate outcome of shortcutting a best practice? You get away with it. And sure enough, flight three flies and returns boosters that are pristine. Until that deviance became the norm for the team and we found our predictable surprise and the loss of Challenger on Flight 25 and the deaths of seven astronauts. So that's what normalization of deviance is. Let's talk now about how do we defend ourselves against it. First line of defense right here. Recognize, I think if you boil personal individual responsibility down to the nucleus, this is what you're left with right here. Is this attitude we carry uh, in all work situations. We're a team, we're all in it together. We have this peer-to-peer -peer responsibility to help each other, to watch out for each other. This certainly takes on very big implications, this attitude does, in hazardous environments. You know, we go out there on the job and have it, okay? I want to very, very briefly here conclude with a comment about courageous self-leadership. Uh, basically, the fundamentals of this are self-challenge and tenacity. Always motivating ourselves and our teams out of our comfort zones and being doggedly tenacious in these ever-expanding goals. Uh, I'm going to use my life here to emphasize this point. A lot of people assume I'm an astronaut now because I was born to it. I was super gifted as a child. Well, let's investigate this. This is my high school graduation photo down in Ambition. It says to attend the Air Force Academy. Couldn't get into the Air Force Academy. My grades weren't good enough. West Point took me, which frankly doesn't say a lot about West Point. But in all fairness to West Point, I was a third alternate for my congressional district. Barely made it into West Point. In a graduation West Point, I wasn't on the stage uh, getting any awards for academic excellence. So destiny did not have genius to work with. This is the varsity club in my high school, the star athletes. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not in this picture. I was no star athlete. See this lady? This is the homecoming queen. I didn't date the homecoming queen. You know, Destin didn't have good looks to work with. This next slide says it all about my youth, the dedication pages from my high school yearbook. I have one dedication, and look what it reads. You missed Korea, but here's hoping you make Vietnam. That, I swear that is the only dedication I have in my entire high school yearbook. What does that say about popularity? Clearly, I wasn't popular, so how did it happen? How did this geeky, nerdy kid go to be an astronaut? And the answer is self-challenge and tenacity.